we're going to move on to our next topic for today, which is called bond disassociation energy. When you're dealing with these covalent bonds, we need to talk about the energy it takes to form and break these bonds. Okay? So if you have a covalent bond, it's holding a molecule together. Let's say we have just the normal, let's just use hydrogen bonded to itself. So you have a bond between the two hydrogens. This bond holds those two hydrogens together. If we want to break this, we need to put energy in. Okay? So that energy that we put in, we call the bond disassociation energy. If you disassociate yourself with things, remember, think about that in terms of your normal everyday stuff. When you disassociate from something, uh, it means you separate yourself from things. So a bond disassociation energy, it's the energy it takes to separate things. We measure that in kilojoules per mole. Um, and the larger the bond dissociation energy, the more stable the molecule. So the more energy it takes to break it means the more stable the molecule was initially. Now, the table down here gives us some, relatively, some relative ideas here. When it comes to strength of bonds and size and length, we can compare single bonds to double bonds to triple bonds. A single bond is going to be the longest of all the bonds. It's also going to be the weakest or the lowest in energy. A double bond is in the middle and a triple bond is the shortest of all our bonds and the highest energy. Down here, these are just some values I pulled off of a table that gives you some comparisons to get an idea of how much energy is there. Okay? So these numbers only represent that of a carbon to carbon single bond, a carbon to carbon double bond, or a carbon to carbon triple bond. So a carbon to carbon single bond, the length is about 154 picometers. It gets shorter as you get double to triple. The energy it takes to break the single bond is 347 kilojoules per mole and then go to a double bond and then go to a triple bond. You see that it grows almost linearly in terms of how much energy it takes to break those bonds. Now the take home message from this, shorter bonds are stronger, more stable and take more energy to break. Okay. Now the upside or the flip side to this is if it takes this much energy to break them, Shorter bonds release more energy when they form them. So as you're forming bonds, you release energy. Breaking bonds takes energy in. Forming bonds releases that energy. Um, so if you're going to form a triple bond, that releases a lot of energy. Uh, you may have heard of nitroglycerin. You may have heard of nitrous oxide in uh, racing applications for cars and those kind of things. What happens is, in both those cases, nitroglycerin, nitrous oxide, TNT, which is trinitrotoluene, they all contain nitrogen. In all three cases, the nitrogen is bonded in a situation where it has a bunch of single bonds. So all three of those explosives, um, nitroglycerin, dynamite, TNT, or even just nitrous, nitrous oxide for like racing car type of stuff, um, they all have single bonds. So because they're all single bonds, they're relatively easy to break. So it doesn't take much energy to break them. But when you do, one of the products of this is you make nitrogen gas. Well, nitrogen gas has a triple bond in it. So the formation of this bond releases a lot of energy. So breaking single bonds is pretty easy, but when you form a triple bond, it releases a lot of extra energy. That's why you see a lot of things that are dealing with explosives have nitrogen in them, because they tend to start with single bonds and then the explosion or the chemical reaction creates the triple bonded. Um, same thing for your typical uh, ammonia fertilizer bombs that people have terrorists have used. Um, they start with nitrates or ammonia which contain nitrogen and then when they get done they produce nitrogen gas which has a triple bond which releases a lot of energy. So they find things that have nitrogen in single bonds which is easy to break 
and then when you form the new ones, they release a lot of energy. So that's one thing we kind of look at in terms of our uh, bonding. If you take a look at bond association energy of what's actually happening, um, in any bond you have two positive nuclei and you have electrons being shared between there. Those electrons are pulling the nuclei in, but the nuclei are pushing each other apart. So if you imagine these being big rubber bands where the electrons are pulling the stuff in and you have kind of a spring pushing them back out. So there's always going to be a balance between pulling in and pushing out, pulling in and pushing out. Okay? That balance of attraction versus repulsion creates our bond length, which then again, if we go back to our bond length, the longer bonds end up being weaker. So the closer we can pull these two nuclei together, the stronger that bond is, the more energy it takes to break that. We can look at this from a graphical perspective also. This is, uh, oops, this is a hydrogen, H2 bond. So if you imagine two nuclei of hydrogen separate, right now there's really no energy between them. As they get closer and closer, they're being attracted together, they start to decrease in energy because as you build the bond, you're losing energy. So their energy goes down, 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 down. At some point, you find the perfect distance between the attraction of the electrons and the repulsion of the nuclei. That perfect distance is the bottom of this graph. That is the least amount of energy that that molecule can have. So as you pull the two molecules together, they hit this perfect spot. But just like anything else in the physical world, if two things are moving close together, okay, they have momentum. So as soon as they get to that perfect spot, they don't just stop instantaneously. They actually overshoot a little bit. So what happens is, is you get too close, like in step four, where now the nuclei push back. So then they push them back. And then they get too far away. And then they push them back. And they go back. And they go back and forth. So all of our bonds, they have an average distance away from them, but they're constantly flexing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, or vibrating in place because they have energy. So what we do is, when we talk about the bond length and the bond disassociation energy, we find the bottom of that trough, graphically, and we say this is the average, this is the best spot. So for hydrogen, it's going to take 432 kilojoules per mole of this gas to raise it out of that trough and to be able to break that bond. So it's going to take a positive 432 to raise it out to break the bond. Okay, When the bond gets formed, you have to release that much energy and it goes down. So absorbing energy to break the bond, releasing energy to form the bond. Okay, So the length is down here in your x-axis. So this happens to be a 74 picometer distance, which then correlates to 432 kilojoules of energy. Every bond in every molecule in every scenario has its own graph, its own curve. So the carbon to carbon bond, if we go back to that, its length is 154 and its energy is 347 kilojoules per mole. So if this was carbon, we'd be over here about 154 and we'd be somewhere in this region, would be its bottom of its trough, because that's what you'd have there. Take home from this slide is as you bring two nuclei closer together, that process of bringing them closer together, that attraction, releases energy. Once they get the right distance, they will overshoot, which then they push back, and then there's going to be a constant vibration throughout time, but essentially they're going to vibrate by by this one point down here at the bottom of the trough, which is we call the bond association energy. So the energy it takes to, to break the bond would be to climb out of the hole. The energy you get from building the bond, you drop into the hole. Okay? That's bond association energy. We're going to start with Vesper on Monday. What I do want to talk about for the last part of today is getting yourselves ready to do our molecular modeling activity. So we're going to jump over to that. So if we go to the website, the molecular modeling activity is on there. It's in a Word file for you guys. What we're going to do is we're going to build a whole bunch of 
Lewis structures. And then we're going to draw them by shape using what we call a Vesper model. Uh, but for now, in preparation for this lab, in preparation for building the molecules, we're going to get the model kits out and actually put them together and do that kind of stuff. We need to set up a grid. You're going to have 12 compounds. They're all listed here for you. Your job is to draw the Lewis structure for all these compounds. If there's resonance, only include the most stable form or forms by calculating formal charges. Then you'll do Vesper structure, Vesper shape, angles, hybridization, sigma bonds, polar move, polarity, intermolecular forces. So you have a whole bunch of things you're going to fill in. Essentially, if you count, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different categories you would need to fill in for each of these uh, molecules. Of those, the only one you can start now is the very first one, where we're actually drawing our Lewis structures. The Lewis structures that we can draw are the key to this activity and the key to the whole unit, really, because if you can't draw the Lewis structures right, you won't be able to do the rest of the stuff behind it either. So right now, you should be able to do the Lewis structures of all 12 of these and check the resin structures by using formal charges. We should have that ability. So what we're going to do for preparation for Monday is I want you to have the grid system ready and you don't have to have all of them done but you should be starting to work on drawing the Lewis structures for all 12 of these molecules in the grid system. Now to do that one of the what I, would, what I would do is set up a piece of paper, as you see here. Um, it has one, two, three, four, five, and if you scroll down, let's make this a little bit smaller. You notice how I put six boxes, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten going across the paper. So this would be half of the molecules, because you're going to need the room and the space to do some of the work. So I would use two pieces of paper, grid it out like you see here, six on one sheet and maybe six on the back or six on a second sheet of paper and make a grid system. Uh, you can use the computer to make it like I've done. You can get out a ruler and a, and a piece of paper and a pencil and do it if you want to also. It doesn't really matter. But each of these boxes or each of these rows would be one molecule. So we'd have Ni3 would go right here and we'd fill in a bunch of information all the way across about Ni3. And then across the top, you could actually label each box and what that is. Okay, so I didn't leave a lot of room in my grid to label those, but each one of these bullet points here is basically going to be one column up here in that. So your assignment for Monday is to start building up this grid system and be ready on Monday to talk about Vesper and also to start working on building all these Lewis structures for this modeling activity, which we're going to do piece by piece through the rest of the unit. Okay, guys, I am done for the day. Uh, hopefully uh, everything makes sense, what I talked about, and I will see you guys uh, tomorrow.